expenditures of the central and the state governments but also the bodies or organizations that are substantially funded by the state or good morning students welcome back to pluto science so today we are in 15th day in our prelims uh, 95 days prelims challenge so today we will see about the constitu constitutional authorities constitutional authorities and constitutional bodies so this is also very very important when it comes to the examination so questions are being asked repeatedly in the prelims exam examination so please try to focus uh, in this topic also right so first authority i have taken is cag so comptroller and auditor general of india comptroller and auditor general of india right so this is very 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 important a lot of questions are being asked uh, from uh, cag so try to focus on so earlier before adopting the constitution there was auditor general of india so once the constitution has coming to effect the auditor general he has assumed the role of comptroller and auditor general of india so basically the appointment and about the position article 148 delineates the <coughs> position of the comptroller and auditor general of india right appointment we will see the cog cog is appointed by the president through a warrant and his hand and seal so this is basically the legal language constitutional language so basically the president president appoints the cag right removal procedure so the removal procedure is similar to that of the removal procedure of the supreme court judge so basically the process of impeachment impeachment uh, through which uh, the uh, judge of a supreme court is removed so basically on that lines the cag is also removed so this shows the importance of the position of the cag so uh, the security of tenure is given to cag because the removal pr procedure is very very strict right similarly no reappointment after retirement so the cag is not eligible for reappointment and similarly he is banned from taking any employment under any government whether it is central government or state government so this is all is uh, made to make the position independent all these measures have been taken to make the position independent because he has to discharge his duties without fear or favor because lot of his work uh, includes Uh, giving i mean scrutinizing the work of the government so because of this reason he has to work independently so because of uh, that reason all these aspects have been incorporated in the constitution right financial autonomy is also provided uh, for the cag so basically <coughs> the expenses expenditures of the consolidated uh, cag are charged uh, on the consolidated fund of india and they are not voted they are not voted so if it is voted there may be a financial dependence so because of that reason uh, the expense expenses are charged on the consolidated fund of india so parliamentary overs uh, oversight so the duties of the terms and conditions and duties of the cag are not enshrined completely in the constitution of india so basically <coughs> the uh, they are determined by the parliament so in this way the cag is made accountable to the parliament of india right so now we understand the duties and the powers of the cag <laughs> his uh, major duty is audit of the accounts of the government both central government and state governments right <laughs> so basically his duties include major duty includes auditing the accounts of the union and the states <laughs> and similarly any authority that is any authority or body that is substantially funded by the governments right so under uh, these auditing activities are done by the laws uh, under the laws made by the parliament right similarly uh, the duty is to submit the reports to the president 
So all the audit reports that have to be submitted to the president and uh, moreover after that the president uh, will lay down the those reports in the parliament both houses of the parliament. So right uh, the auditing audit reports that are pertaining to states they are submitted to the governors and uh, after that the governor will lay those reports in the state respective state legislatures. Similarly uh, there is a shift in resp responsibilities of the CAG. So earlier before 1976 he was both doing the accounting uh, aspects and auditing aspects also. So now after 1976 the CAG no longer hand handles responsibilities related to compilation and main maintenance of accounts. So this responsibility has taken away and presently the CAG only uh, uh, do the work of auditing. So his uh, present uh, duty includes only auditing. Right. So similarly another duty is scrutiny of financial affairs. So the CAG scrutinizes the financial affairs of the executive ensuring that dis disturbed money uh, disbursed money in accounts was legally available I mean whatever money was disbursed by the parliament or uh, sanctioned by the parliament it is legally available for utilizing right <coughs> and uh, similarly the expenditures are according to the norms laid down so this is the uh, duty uh, this is one of the important duties of the CAG similarly the scope of the audit so the CAG audits transactions of the central and state governments related to contingency fund and uh, public accounts. Try to remember this uh, point. So the scope ex extends to auditing uh, consolidated funds. So consolidated fund, contingency fund, contingency fund also, and uh, similarly public accounts. Public account funds. <coughs> Now, another duty is examination of finances. The COG audits the receipts and expenditures of organizations substantially funded by the central or state revenue. So, not only the COG audits the uh, expenditure uh, expenditures of the central and the state governments, but also the bodies or organizations that are substantially funded by the state or central governments. Right. So this is all about the CAG and uh, second important authority under the constitution is Attorney General of India. So basically it is uh, one of the important offices created by the constitution. So basically the uh, Attorney General will look after the legal aspects, legal aspects of the government, government of India. Right. So basically the attorney general is also appointed by the president <coughs> serving at the pleasure of the president. So basically the attorney general serves during the pleasure of the president. Right. So basically when it comes to the nature of the role, emoluments and the service conditions, all these are determined by the parliament. So not much is mentioned about the, sorry, uh, not much is mentioned about the uh, term the service conditions and the emoluments all all these are decided by the parliament through a subsequent act so now we will understand the functions and duties of the uh, attorney general he is a legal advisor to the central government so this is his, this is his primary responsibility and duty right the primary function of the attorney general is to provide legal advice to the central government on matters referred to him right he is the first law officer of the government of India. So remember this point, very, very important. <coughs> he is the first officer of the first legal officer of the government of India. Right. Execution of legal duties. So he is interested with uh, duties of legal character as assigned by the government of India. As you all know, he represents government of India uh, in all the courts. He can represent the government of India in all the courts within the ter territory of India. 
so he rep- represents and uh, defends the government of india uh, in any cases that are involving uh, the government of india so basically he can uh, represent the government of india in any court that is existing in the territory of india right <coughs> so basically the position of the uh, attorney general of india that is mentioned in article 76 of the constitution of india similarly he is also responsible for discharging functions conferred on him by the constitution or any prevailing law so basically he has to discharge the functions that are designated through the constitution and also any other uh, function that he that uh, uh, can be such a, that can be asked by the government to discharge so basically this is the uh, these are the roles and the responsibilities of the uh, attorney general of india now we will understand the participation the attorney general's participation in the parliament so basically he is not the member of the parliament attorney general is not the member of the parliament member of the parliament but he can participate in the uh, discussions or debates in the parliament he can participate in the discussions and uh, debates in the parliament he has also the power of speaking in the parliament or any uh, any committees They, uh, we have understood earlier that there are a lot of committees under the parliament both ad hoc and standing committees so basically the uh, attorney general has the right to participate and uh, speak in those uh, sessions and even in the meetings of the committees so he has the that power special power so however he he ha- he cannot vote uh, in the parliament in uh, in the houses of the parliament or in the committees so he has the right to participate and speak but he do not have the power to vote in those uh, meetings or in the uh, meetings of the committees so these are some of the aspects about the attorney general right now we will understand the special officer for linguistic minorities so this is also one of the authorities important authorities but however it is less discussed so the constitution also creates and uh, an authority uh, the authority of special officer for linguistic minorities linguistic minor- minorities are minorities because they belong to a particular language i mean they speak a particular language uh, but the members who are speaking that uh, language are numerically very less so linguistic minorities earlier also we have discussed when we were discussing the fundamental rights the constitution uh recognizes only two kinds of minorities one is uh, religious minorities and the second one is linguistic minorities All right so basically the officer will be appointed by the president of india and uh, the office was established to investigate matters pertaining to the safeguards provided for linguistic minorities in the constitution so basically they will investigate whether the uh, whether the safeguards provided in the constitution whether they are properly implemented or not so this will be the primary responsibility of the uh, this particular authority so basically he reports his findings and recommendations to the president so basically whatever the findings or recommendations they will be presented to the president in the form of a report and the president subsequently present those those reform uh, suggestions or the reports to the parliament for consideration right so basically article 350b uh, it was when uh, first when the constitution was adopted this position was not there in the original constitution it was incorporated through the subsequent amendments by inserting a new article article 350b so in 1956 this particular amendment was made in 1956 when reorganization of states took place reorganization of states took place right right so functions we have already understood so basically investigation about the safeguards that have been provided to the 
linguistic minorities in the constitution whether they are properly being implemented or not similarly <coughs> reporting to the president so all those findings and the suggestions if there are any suggestions they have to be uh, given to the president and a parliamentary presentation the president will lay those reports uh, submit those reports to the parliament right right so this is all about the special officer on linguistic minorities so these are the some of the authorities created by the constitution now we will try and understand about the bodies constitutional bodies that are created to the constitution right first one is very very important one finance commission so finance commission very very important it is appointed for every 5 years by the president so now we have the presently we have 15th commission it is appointed under the chairmanship of nk singh right until now 14th uh, 14 finance commission have commissions have been appointed and they have submitted their reports now the 15th finance commission is appointed he is being has been appointed and it is doing its work it is under the process right once the 15th commission presents its reports the whatever the recommendations that will be given so they will be operation they will be in operation from 2025 26 to 2029 30 so basically the recommendations that will be in operation for generally for 5 years so try to remember these aspects also so the uh, recommendations of the 14th commission 14th finance commission that are are now in operation right so articles that are supporting the finance commission are articles 270 article 273 article 275 so basically the article 275 this uh, talks about the grants in aid grants in aid to states and article 280 also so basically all these are articles are related with the finance commission right so basically the uh, finance commission's mandate comes through article 280 <clears throat> so basically the finance commission is constituted for every 5 years according to according to the article of 280 comprising a chairman and four other members so chairman and four more members will be there all these people will be appointed by the president right so basically the constitution also lays down some qualifications to be appointed as the chairman and members to try to remember these i mean conditions or qualifications so they may be asked as a point under a under a question so you have to uh, be aware with the qualifications when it comes to appointment of chairman and the members so chairman he must possess significant experience in public affairs so basically an economist a distinguished economist will be appointed as the chairman of the finance commission so the qualification defined in the constitution is the person should be a significant should have an uh, significant experience in public affairs so the members uh, qualifications are so we have understood that there will be four members so four members will be representing diverse diverse fields right we can see those diverseness in the qualifications prescribed so one member should be high court judge or qualified candidate to be appointed as a judge of the high court high court so this is he should have some uh, judicial knowledge right knowledge so this is the domain expert domain second person should be individual with a specialized knowledge in government finances so this is the second qualification third one is person with extensive experience in financial matter matters and administration so one one person should be having experience and knowledge in financial matters and administration third individual uh, fourth individual he should be with specific specific expertise in economics so this uh, fourth person should be having expertise in economics so basically these are the qualification prescribed for appointment of four members to the finance commission all right 
So now distribution of financial resources, this is the major and the primary responsibility. Primary responsibility of the finance commission. So basically the distribution is both vertical distribution, vertical distribution. So vertical distribution is between center and states. Right. Similarly, the finance commission also uh, gives recommendations for horizontal distribution. Horizontal distribution. Distribution. So this is between the states. Between the states. So try to remember this is the primary duty of the uh, finance commission to give recommendations to suggest a mechanism for distribution of finance between center and states. So basically the distribution of powers uh, of two kinds one is uh, vertical distribution that is between the center and the states and the horizontal distribution that is between the states right. So right. <clears throat> it also describes the, or gives the recommendations or principles for governing the grants in aid. So whatever the grants in aid are actually prescribed under article 275. So after the distribution of revenues, uh, the net tax revenues, so thus there is a provision for grants in aid for states. So to meet the special requirements of the states, special financial requirements of the states, requirements of the states. So basically to give these grants in aid, there will be a formula. So that formula will be decided or framed by the finance commission. So based on that formula, the grants in aid will be made to the particular state governments. Right. So president's refill and additional matters. So right. The finance commission may address any matter referred to by the president. So president can refer any particular mat matter apart from the distribution of revenues, net revenues between the center and state. So that uh, duty uh, also shall be done by the finance commission. Earlier we have seen uh, when 14th, 14th finance commission was in operation, many other uh, I mean duties have been entrusted uh, to the 14th financial commission and uh, those aspects also led to some kind of uh, disagreements between the center and the states. So there, uh, there is some controversy involved with the 14th commission, uh, 14th finance commission. So try to remember these aspects also. Right. Similarly, there are state commissions according to the articles 73rd and 74th constitutional amendments. So yesterday we have studied about them, local bodies, local self-governments, both at the rural areas and urban areas. So to distribute the finances between the state and the local bodies, the finance state finance commission has to be uh, constituted right right so this is uh, some these are some of the aspects about the finance commission now we will see another important body election commission so basically the major uh, duty of the election commission is to conduct impartial and independent elections to both parliament and the state legislatures so basically the constitution of india has instituted this power of conducting elections in the election commission of india right this is the crucial body entrusted with overseeing the entire election process and machinery so basically elections are conducted majorly for center and state legislature similarly it will also conduct elections for uh, election of the president vice president the members of the rajya sabha and the state legislative councils also Right. These are the some of the responsibilities of the election commission. Now we will understand the composition of the election commission. So chief election commissioner will be there. This is the more, uh, he is the most important person. Right. So basically the election commission, it will be led by the chief election commissioner. And uh, <coughs> right. So basically the chief election commissioner earlier i mean earlier he used to appoint he used to be appointed by the president directly i mean whomever uh, who, whomever name is suggested by the uh, council of ministers that person used to be appointed by the chief election commissioner now there is a change so we will in the end we will understand what are those changes right similarly appointment of commissioners 
right so the president uh, <coughs> initially the president was appointing the other election commissioners also so earlier it was a multi member body so there is a provision within the constitution itself that the election commission can be a single member body comprising only the chief election commissioner however two more election commissioners can be appointed appointed and it can be made as a multi member body so after the ninth lok sabha elections the election commission became a single member body right but subsequently in 1993 93 uh, it evolved into a multi member body again it was made as a multi member body so earlier it was a multi member body after the ninth lok sabha elections it was made as a single member body and uh, subsequently in 1993 again it was made as a multi member body uh, sorry uh, multi member body means there will be a chief election commissioner and two more election commissioners uh, to oversee the entire process of elections so when it comes to administrative decisions try to remember this aspect all the three uh, personalities i mean the chief election commissioner and uh, two election commissioners when it comes to administrative matters within the election commission all three of them have, have equal powers so try to remember this aspect also right so equal decision making authority so this is the point i was uh, mentioning so both the chief election commissioner and uh, election commissioner they hold equal powers equal decision making authority within the commission so basically uh, the decisions within the election commission they are taken based on the consensus all the three members agree or through the majority so if two members agrees and when when one member disagrees that will become i mean that becomes actionable so basically the measures are uh, the decisions are taken through the majority or through the consensus right so earlier the president was appointing the chief election commissioner and the other election commissioners but uh, there was a petition in the supreme court and uh, the PT, uh, the supreme court has prescribed a mecha mechanism uh, for the appointment of the chief uh, chief election commissioner but the government has subsequently recently brought in a law by uh, modifying the judgment of the supreme court and it the present mechanism it has defined a separate mechanism that is what in existence at present so the present mechanism is the cac and election commissioners chief election commissioner and other election commissioners will be appointed by the president based on the recommendation of a select committee so there will be a select committee that committee will recommend the appointment of chief election commissioner and other election commissioners so the committee is important here that selection committee so basically the committee comprises of three members the first member is prime minister so there will be a prime minister uh, there will be prime minister in that committee and a union called the cabinet uh, minister will be there preferably the law minister and the leader of opposition or the leader of the largest opposition party in the lok sabha so basically uh, these three members will be uh, members are there in the committee the prime minister the cabinet minister a cabinet minister preferably the law minister and the leader of the opposition so here you can see in this committee there is a domination of the executive ruling party right so earlier when the honorable supreme court gave its judgment so instead of a union cabinet minister the supreme court cji chief justice of india was there in this position however in the sub subsequent law the government changed this composition and in the place of chief justice of india a union cabinet minister was placed right so this is the present uh, present uh, mechanism i mean uh, mechanism of composition of the select selection committee right so in order to make the uh, election commission independent and uh, to provide it's a sort of independence there are some provisions have been prescribed within the constitution so to make to make sure that members are functioning independently certain uh, me uh, certain measures have been incorporated in the constitution itself so right so basically the service conditions of the chief election commissioner so he it's they shall not be altered to his disadvantage during the uh, appointment so once the chief election commissioner has been appointed the service con conditions cannot be altered altered to his disadvantage 
this is one of the safeguards right removal from office requires impeachment process uh, similar to that of the removal of the judge of the supreme court so basically it requires the process of impeachment so basically there is a security of tenure for chief election commissioner however you can see here the same uh, safeguard is not available for election commissioners right so the present mechanism is uh, the election commissioners can be removed on the recommendation of the chief election commissioner so the critics are demanding that the same uh, security of tenure for the election commissioner uh, election commissioners also the mechanism that should be provided is impeachment so however at present the election commissioners the two election commissioners they can be removed based on the recommendations of the chief election commissioner however the chief election commissioner can only remove through the process of impeachment uh, that is similar to the method of removal of the judge of the supreme court all right so functions of the election commission so the primary responsibility of the chief election commissioner include directing controlling and conducting all election electoral operations so this is the primary responsibility <coughs> it also includes preparation of electoral rolls and uh, the organization of elections for parliament state legislatures as well as election of president and vice president this we have seen additionally the election commission holds both administrative and quasi judicial functions including power to settle election disputes so basically these are the functions and powers of the uh, chief election commissioner so basically similarly we have uh, similar to finance state finance commission we have state election commissions under the uh, 73rd and 74th constitutional amendment acts so basically these election commissions state election commissions are interested with the duty of conducting elections for the local bodies both at the rural level and at the and at the urban level another important body is uh, constitutional bodies official language commission so in accordance with the accordance with the indian constitution hindi in devanagari script holds the status of the official language so remember that uh, this is the provision that is incorporated in the constitution the hindi uh, language that is in the devanagari script so this holds the position status of the uh, official language remember this is not national language so this is official language right so this will be the official language of the union of india <coughs> so similarly the constitution provides empowers the president to constitute official language commission for every 10 years from the commencement of the constitution so under this provisions only uh, the official language commissions will be appointed by the president for every 10 years right composition of the official language commission so there will be a chairman and there will be another members Uh, how many members uh, the president uh, deem uh, seems fit i mean he deems fit he can appoint as many as members to the commission so basically it comprises of chairman and some other members right recommendations and functions of the official language commission so <coughs> basically the duty or recommendations of the official language commission shall include progressive use of hindi so basically the recommendations the commission should make recommendations for uh, progressive use of hindi language for official purposes within the union so it should suggest measures for the progressive use of progressive means increasing increasing use of hindi in for official purposes language of hindi for official purposes similarly restriction of uh, english language so as you can see in the constitution Uh, hindi uh, was made as the official language however english can be used uh, in place of hindi for official uh, official communication so here the duty entrusted to official commission is it should gradually restrict the use of english language for official communication so it should include the recommendation should include proposals for restrictions on the use of Eng english language for any official purpose right numerals usage, usage so the numerals means numbers 
so basically at present we are using uh, english numbers only whatever the numbers are using we are using 1 2 3 4 5 these are uh, english numbers only so basically the commission should also make recommendations the form of new numerals that can be, that have to be employed for the uh, specified purposes for within the union of india so this is also one of the important responsibilities of the official language commission right additional matters so any other matter concerning of official language of the union language language for and between the union and the states and also between the states so these matters can be referred to the official language uh, commission by the president and it, it has to give its recommendations uh, on those matters right so similarly the duty is one of the duties is promotional uh, promotion of uh, linguistic harmony promotion of linguistic harmony i mean harmony between the people who are speaking different languages so the overarching objective of the official language commission is to foster linguistic harmony within the union and between the various states so this is one of the important duties of the official uh, sorry official language commission so by addressing language related issues and making recommendations the commission contributes to maintaining equilibrium in language language usage across all diverse regions so this is the uh, emphasis of the official this will be the emphasis of official language commission however uh, we can understand through the developments that the official language we can say it failed to uh, i mean uh, failed to realize its duties because uh, during 1960s and 1970s 1970s there was anti hindi anti hindi agitation agitation in south india and especially in tamil nadu there was a uh, violence and uh, so the i mean protests have been uh, subsumed through this uh, subsequent acts so there is official languages act so there are some uh, kind of measures were there to uh, dilute the challenge of language so however the challenge still goes on the uh, challenges of official language challenges of making uh, official language uh, uh, hindi as the official whole uh, whole and sole official language it is uh, still facing challenges and uh, there are diverse opinions some people support it and uh, say that hindi should be promoted as the single official language however there are some other experts who say that it should be a natural thing language is a natural thing and it should be left to the people right and there are several languages uh, basically the constitution recognizes 22 languages and there are many thousands of language and further thousands of dialects are there and those diversity has to be respected and some of this is the opinion opinion of the some other experts so when we discuss the main topics we will go we will dive deep into the analytical part of the official language so for prelims aspect you try to remember these aspects right another important commission union public service commission this is also one of the important uh, bodies created by the constitution right so this role of uh, union public service commission its role is basically about recruiting the people and uh, giving recommendations to the <coughs> government on certain matters related to the uh, services or about the central government employees however it is a crucial body and uh, plays a crucial role in recruiting the employees of the government i mean public servants right so similarly the constitution also assigns some advisory functions to the uh, upsc so the subjects are uh, may be reviewed by the parliament and the, the, i mean the roles and the responsibility uh, responsibilities of the upsc union public service commission they can be uh, modified by the parliament right so we will understand the roles and the responsibilities of upsc so it is the recruitment authority so this is its primary and major function so upsc is responsible for recruiting candidates to all india services and central civil services that includes both class 1 and class 2 employees so this is the primary and most important function of the upsc it recruits 
uh, it recruits candidates for all india services and central civil services similarly it has advisory functions so the constitution endows upsc with advisory functions focusing on methods of recruitment principles of appointment promotions transfers and the disciplinary matters so here also when taking disciplinary action on the public servants the recommendations of upsc becomes very very important similarly on legal proceeding proceedings and pension related claim so on all these aspects the upsc has the advisory role right annual reports similarly the upsc prepares annual reports and uh, the reports will be submitted to the president and subsequently the president lays those reports before the parliament right so consultation areas for central government when it comes to upsc we have understood that the U government consults upsc on various aspects those are recruitment methods principles of appointments uh, disciplinary matters legal proceedings and pension claims so on all these aspects the government may consult upsc right now we will understand the composition and the tenure of upsc so number of members there is no mention of number 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 of upsc members in the constitution so <coughs> this is basically decided decided by parliament through a subsequent act right qualification at least half of the members must must be government employees with a minimum of 10 years of government experience so this is one of the qualifications prescribed by the uh, constitution term of office so members hold office until the age of 65 years or for a term of 6 years whichever comes first so basically they hold the office for 65 years or for the for a tenure of 6 years so whichever comes earlier so uh, that that I mean, whichever comes first right chairman's department so the chairman is prohibited from accepting any employment under government of a state whether uh, i mean while the mem i mean the chairman uh, is prevented uh, from taking any further employment however when it comes to members the members of the upsc they are eligible for appointment only one position either as the chairman of the upsc or state public service commission so the members of the upsc can be appointed as the chairman of upsc or as the chairman of a state public service commission however the chairman of the upsc he is not eligible for further employment right next is another important very very important commission national commission for scheduled caste so this is earlier both national commission for scs and scs STs. so one single commission was there for both uh, scheduled castes and scheduled tribes however in 2003 the national commission for scheduled uh, tribes has been separated and uh, it was created as an independent body until now there was a single and a uniform uh, single uh, commission for both scheduled tribes and scheduled castes right so the constitution established the national commission for scheduled castes a significant constitutional body tasked with safeguarding the rights and welfare of the scheduled castes in india composition so basically the uh, the commission consists of a chairperson vice chairperson and uh, three other members right basically the article 338a uh, sorry article 338 it uh, provides and uh, it the article creates the national commission for scheduled caste so basically there will be a chairman there will be a vice chairman and another three members will be there so president appoints all these members president vice president and the three other members functions <coughs> the uh, commission has its uh, the authority to regulate its own procedure so this is some sort of independence given to the commission so primary duties we will understand the primary duties uh, investigation and monitoring so basically the commission will investigate the matters related to safeguards provided for scheduled castes evaluating their effectiveness under the constitution so basically it also examines the existing law laws or uh, the existing mechanisms for the betterment and welfare of the scheduled 
cause. So basically, it examines all these aspects and gives its recommendations to the government. Right. Similarly, another important role, complaint inquiry. So it inquires into the specific complaints regarding the deprivation of rights and the safeguards of the scheduled cause. So one important thing is to looking look into the laws and the mechanisms existing for the welfare of the scheduled cause and whether to examine whether they are working properly or not. Second important thing is important duty is inquiring into specific complaints uh, regarding the deprivation of rights and the safeguards for the scheduled cause. Similarly, participation in planning. So to participate and advise on the socio-economic development of the scheduled cost. So basically this uh, National Commission for Scheduled Cost also has this particular responsibility. It can participate in the preparation of plans for socio-economic development of the scheduled cost. Right. Reporting. So basically it submits the annual reports to the president about the welfare of the uh, scheduled cost and uh, the president subsequently places these reports before the parliament right recommendations it makes recommendations in reports for protection welfare and socio economic development of scheduled cost so other functions to discharge other functions related to protection welfare development and advancement of scheduled cost are specified by the president so basically the president may give these additional responsibility to the national commission of national commission of schedule cost right so basically when it comes to the investigative powers it provides the powers of a civil code so basically this is a quasi judicial power quasi judicial power so whenever it is functioning investigative uh, duties i mean whenever it is examining particular complaints about the deprivation and uh, welfare of the schedule cost so during that uh, period it will possess uh, powers like summoning and enforcing the attendance of individuals across india uh, requiring documents uh, documented discovery and production receiving evidence of uh, evidence of evidence on affidavits requesting public records or copies from any court of office issue uh, issuing com commissions for witness and document document examination so these are the some of the powers exercised, uh, the powers are equal to that of the civil court, right. So consultation on major policy matters. So the government consults uh, for major policy formulations with respect to uh, the welfare of the welfare of scheduled cause, right. So the union and every state government are obliged to consult the commission on all major policy matters affecting scheduled cost. So these are some of the important aspects about the National Commission for Scheduled Cost. Right. Now we will see the uh, last body in our lecture that is National Commission for Scheduled Tribes. So till now, till 2003, uh, the commissions were same for both SCs and STs. So in 2003, through the 89th Constitutional Amendment Act, a new article, Article 338A was incorporated through which the National Commission for Scheduled Tribes has been established as a separate commission. Right. So this body is dedicated to safeguarding the rights and welfare of scheduled tribes in India. So the powers and uh, functions are similar to, mostly, majorly similar to that of the National Commission for Scheduled Cause only. However, we will broadly survey the powers and functions. So, constitutional provision, uh, Article 338A, Article 338A. So, this is the basis for creation of National Commission for Scheduled Tribes. The commission comprises of chairperson, vice chairperson, and three other members. So, all of them are appointed by the president. So, it has also it has the power to regulate its own procedure. So, primary duties are investigation and monitoring. <coughs> so, investigate and, and, uh, and uh, investigate and monitor matters related to 
safeguards provided for scheduled tribes under constitution under existing laws or government orders and evaluate effectiveness each of those aspects similarly complaints inquiry so it can look into the complaints specific complaints that are depriving the rights and the safeguards that have been provided to the scheduled tribes right participation in planning to participate and advise on the socio economic development planning for scheduled tribes assessing progress under union and states so reporting it will submit annual reports to the president about the welfare of the scheduled tribes and what are the further measures that have to be taken for the welfare of the scheduled tribes and subsequently president who i mean uh, submits those reports uh, to the parliament recommendations it makes recommendations in reports for protection welfare and socio economic development of scheduled tribes other functions so the president may entrust further functions to the national commission for scheduled tribes ncst for betterment of scheduled tribes so while uh, discharging its investigative powers it assumes the powers of a civil court so through that civil court it can exercise all these powers to uh, properly ex examine that particular complaint right similarly consultation on major policy matters so the states and the union government can consult the national commission for scheduled tribes ncst uh, for preparation and implementation of proper implementation of plans relating to the scheduled tribes so uh, this is some information about the ncsc and uh, ncst right so these are the some of the important uh, constitutional authorities and bodies I, I thought which are important for the purpose of, purpose of examination so try to try to study further on these aspects and try to cover the aspect of there are many non constitutional bodies non constitutional bodies some are legal bodies some are just uh i mean they came to they, they came to existence on the executive orders so some uh, there are some bodies like national commission for women national commission for protection of children's rights so those uh, bodies are there similarly uh, the niti ayog is there right earlier planning commission was there so now the planning commission has been replaced by niti ayog so try to gather some information about these bodies also so they may also come in the examination so right because of the paucity of time i could only cover the constitutional bodies so try to gather some information about the uh, non constitutional bodies also right now we will see some questions one two questions that are asked previously from this part the so first question it is asked in 2023 just before exam uh consider the following organizations or bodies in india national commission for ba backward classes national human rights commission national law commission national consumer disputes redressal commission so how many above these are constitutional bodies so very simple and straight question if you know what uh, i mean which of them are constitutional bodies and which of them are non constitutional bodies you can answer this question so here national commission for backward classes this is a constitutional body earlier this was not there but recently a decade ago this was incorporated as a constitutional body for the uh, protection and welfare of the backward classes backward classes so because of paucity of time i could not cover this body but the functions powers and functions everything the composition also it is similar to uh, the commissions both commission we have discussed ncsc and ncst so the powers and functions are similar to national commission for backward classes also uh, try to uh, gather some information about this body so rest of the commissions the national human rights commission it is a legal body not a constitutional body legal body national law commission <clears throat> so basically law commission is uh, uh, rec makes recommendations for legal reforms in india legal reforms in india so national consumer disputes Red redressal commission so this is also a non constitutional body 
right this is also a legal body so answer is only one only national commission for backward classes is the constitutional body rest of them are non constitutional bodies next question it is asked in 2012 uh, the question is according to the constitution of india it is the duty of the president of india to cause to be laid before the parliament which of the following so basically the question is based on the reports that will be sub submitted by various commissions to the president and subsequently the president will submit those reports to the parliament so recommendations of the union finance commission a report of the public accounts committee psc <coughs> this is a parliamentary or uh, i mean it is a parliamentary committee psc right next uh, report of the controller controller and auditor general report of the cast next report of the national commission for scheduled cast so just before we have studied that uh, the recommendations or reports of the union finance commission they will be submitted to the president and the president further submits submits them to the parliament the report of the controller and auditor general they will also submitted uh, they will also be submitted and the president submits them to the parliament similarly the same proce same process applicable to national commission for scheduled cast also however the difference is that the report of the public accounts committee basically it is a parliamentary committee right so its recommendations are not submitted to president so it is a mechanism psea P, psc public accounts committee is a mechanism to ensure the accountability of the executive so right basically the primary duty of psc is to examine the reports submitted by the cag controller and the auditor general of india right so basically the answer is 1 3 and 4 answer c so except the reports of the psc public accounts committee all the reports and recommendations of the three other bodies they will be submitted to the president and further president submit submits them to the parliament right so this is all for uh, today i hope you gain some uh, important information and uh, this is all for today uh, see you see you next time until then bye Thank mm -hmm. you.